Hello and welcome to this week's Motor Week. Coming up on this week's show, Ian Royal drives a hard bargain as he checks out the Deu. Brendan has a car or scooter, well something anyway, with staggering proportions. And I test a couple of sporty little numbers. City chic indeed. Some city cars look like they could change your life forever. They might be smaller than a packet of fags. They may use less fuel than a primer stove. Or maybe they look funkier than a disco diva's pants drawer. And then there's the Golf Diesel. In fact, it's the Golf 1.9 TDI PD100 BHP, if you want to give it its full title. A title that might well hold your interest longer than the car itself. I mean, what is it? It's a Golf, it's from Volkswagen, it's got a 1.9 litre diesel engine and it puts out, well, guess, 100 BHP. That's it, no bells, no whistles, no gimmicks, no fripperies. It does exactly what it says on the badge and no more. And that is where we start to see what the Golf TDI is all about. Because let's just get this straight in our minds. What do we actually want when we buy a city car anyway? Well, for a start, we don't want to be punting around in something the size of a houseboat. Equally, we don't want something so pokey that we can't even fit in a little bit of shopping or maybe a couple of mates at the weekend. Equally, when it comes to performance, we're not exactly after a Formula One car here, but we don't really want to be left behind at the lights by too many old ladies on bicycles. And finally, this might be a car that we're buying with a serious purpose in mind but we don't want too many people laughing at us. So just a little bit of style would be nice. So let's take these one by one, shall we? First of all, size. And to quote that sort from the Renault ad, it really does matter. Now, while some manufacturers seem to be claiming that by shaving an extra inch or so off the boot of the car, it'll change your life forever and you'll be able to park the thing in a storm drain, the Golf just gets on with being golf-sized, middle of the road, really. And it is a thought, because what will you actually gain by losing that extra inch or so? You're really not going to be able to squeeze it into a space that's significantly smaller than you'd get this car into. So why then bother with real tiddlers like the Corsa, the Clio and even the Lupo from VW themselves? It is a thought, isn't it? Ah, performance, our favourite. Now, there's not a lot of room in towns and cities and there are quite strict rules against exploring the more intergalactic ends of a car's performance within the confines of a town or city. So you've got to be careful. You don't actually want too much power. What you need, above all else, is usability and that is precisely what you get in the Golf. At no point is there anything it does that gets in the way. Because it's a diesel, this 1.9 engine, and it is a new diesel engine to the Golf, it pulls away from just about zero revs. You don't really need to change gear unless you want to change the engine, no. And that's it. That sums up the driving experience. It is extraordinarily balanced, neutral, forgiving. It's not too light or too heavy on the steering. The brakes are perfectly up to the job. All in all, you barely notice you're driving the thing at all. And then that brings us on to style. Well, it's never going to turn heads in the way that the new Mini does, or maybe even the Toyota Yaris might. Quite the opposite, in fact. It seems to slip by as if invisible. And that seems to be what buyers of the Golf are after, that kind of blandness, that low visibility -ness. I don't know whether they're all undercover coppers or spies or what, but that seems to be what they're after. So if ultra-discreet blandness is your thing, feast your eyes on this. And there is one thing we haven't even mentioned yet, price. We're not buying a big flash car here to impress our friends, so we don't want to be paying big flash money. Well, it might be a bit of a shock at first because the Golf is never going to be a cheap car. You'll pay between 14,216 and a half grand for any diesel engine or any Golf with this particular diesel engine in it. If you start adding accessories and bells and whistles on it, that could push past 18 or even 19,000, which is a lot of money for a city car. But let's bear in mind, shall we, it is quite big for a city car. It will last forever. It's a Volkswagen. Odds are it'll never go wrong. And also, and importantly, if you do decide to sell it eventually, you should get more money back. Its resale value will be better. It'll hold its value better than the equivalent cars from the likes of Renault, Ford, Vauxhall. Of course, one place in which the Golf always will win out over smaller city cars is, 
but when you get out of the city, stick the thing on the motorway with this 100 brake horsepower diesel engine, wallop, off you go. It'll sit there, ticking along nicely all day, using barely any fuel, and I do mean economical. At the moment, it's telling me I'm getting about 50 miles to the gallon average. If I really am, that's very, very good. Another way this car will win out with this particular diesel engine in is in terms of taxation, because there are advantages to having cars that give out less CO2. This engine is pretty clean, so that should help it be a bestseller in the Golf range. You could look at this in one of two ways. On the one hand, let's be honest, it's a bit boring. It'll cost you more to buy than the far prettier and more exciting new Mini. And to be honest, it's barely any faster than even a moderately warm hatch. On the other hand, you could say it is handsome in a quiet sort of a way. Although it might cost you a few quid to buy, it won't cost you much to run and it should never break down ever. It is in fact eminently sensible. We love sensible, don't we? There's probably very little doubt that small cars are the way forward, especially with our ever congested roads and spiralling fuel costs. And over the past few years, a whole new category has been thought up by the leading manufacturers. City cars are apparently the cars of the future, or so they claim. Well, are they really? Not everyone's happy about going small. Me? I like big cars, but take this car for instance, the Deo Matiz. It's tiny, but it's high. It claims to be able to seat five adults in comfort, but it has a tiny engine so small and so lacking in power, my lawnmower goes quicker. I think the Matiz is something of a bit of a fashion statement trying to burst out of its rather dowdy lines. If this car wore anything other than its Deo badge on the front, you could see it being rather chic and elegant in certain circles, but unfortunately it's not as it stands, that is. But don't let that put you off. Inside, quite frankly, it's yuck. Masses and masses of drab grey plastic. I mean, it just looks awful, to be honest. Why is it that car manufacturers from the Far East just can't seem to get the interiors right, no matter how hard they try? I'm not asking for wood and leather, but they could do an awful lot better. And what about what's under the bonnet? Well, a tiny 800cc engine, 50 brake horsepower. Of course, it's economical, around 45 to the gallon, but a diesel Polo will do more. The Matiz was first launched into the market in 1998, so the earliest examples you'd find would be on an S-plate. Look around for those cars. There's very little smaller than this on the market, apart from maybe the smart car, but I think that this is best avoided for long journeys. The driving position in the Matiz is actually quite good because you sit so high. It's not quite as high as in an off-roader, but it gives you good visibility and you can see over the hedges going down country lanes like this. Uh, the brakes are pretty good, the steering is fairly sharp and responsive, but the gearbox, quite frankly, is a bit of a mess. It clunks about between changes. Now, being a tall car, it does tend to suffer, particularly in high winds at high speed, so going down the motorway, you do find it swaying about a bit. What about performance? Well, to be honest, in a car like this, it's absolutely irrelevant. Nought to 60 in top speeds don't mean a thing. Chief rivals in the marketplace for the Matiz are the Daihatsu Move or something like the Suzuki Wagon R, or maybe even slightly differently, the Ford car. Now, I know that the car is slightly different to this in terms of it not being as practical, but it's way better to drive. So what do you have to pay to get a good Deu Matiz? Well, take this example. It's a V-Reg, so it's around two years old. It's done slightly above mileage of 40,000, but it's 3,800 pounds. There aren't too many Matizes out there in the marketplace. The best, best area to find them, to be honest, is at main dealers. An early S-Reg car, about two and a half thousand pounds, a T-Reg three grand, or an X-Reg for around five grand, which is still a big saving on the new list price.
Now, there's no doubt that these city cars have many advantages. Small, economical and easy to park. And under the government's new emissions regulations, they'll also save you money if this was your company car. The Matiz looks small and tinny and cheap, which of course it is. £3,800 for a two-year-old example like this with 40000 on the clock compared to seven grand new. And so that's this week's One Careful Owner, the Deu Matiz. After the break, Brendan has a fun car for us to look at. Yes, that's right, a fun car. That's its name, fun car. Now, in my career as a motoring correspondent, I've been to some amazing locations to test drive some superb cars. Ferraris in France, Lamborghinis in Italy, Mercedes in America, TVRs in Blackpool even beat this, because today, the peak of my career is a trip to Oswald Twistle to test drive the Funtec 50. Glamour, glamour, glamour. Have a look. Now I know what you're thinking, is it a bike, is it a car? Well, I don't know. The answer is probably somewhere in between. But what it is, is a bike or a car that you can ride or drive on the basic moped motorcycle license. So if you're 16, you've got one of those, you can drive on one of these. They're great fun, but I'm not so sure. I'm going to get some instruction before I ever go. He's around here somewhere, let's go and find him. Tell us about what equipment there is and how to operate it. Right, very simple. Uh, in a word, like the scooter side of it, or the bike side of it, uh, you've got a twist grip throttle on your right hand, uh, the car side of it, um, your foot brake mounted on the floor, uh, you have a handbrake, which is just as it is to hold you on the hill. Uh -huh. um, forward only, reverse, quite a simple matter. That's oh. reverse gear. Can That's you see Steve's gear. foot? That's yeah. reverse gear, That's your left foot. <laughs> uh, simpler than pushing a scooter backwards. In nitro drive, it's a three wheel, essentially a three wheel vehicle, or three wheels on the road at any one time. Um, nitro drive in it, uh, full throttle most of the time. Uh, on corners, um, just take it a little bit easy at first, but once you've got used to the, the balance of it, uh, you can do some very weird and wonderful things with the, uh, the handling. As I say bang, everyone lean to the right. Bang! Bang! Ah! There we go. Get to bank, it helps. Helps stabilise the car. Now, if you think this looks precarious, that's because it is. The Funtec 50 is, well, it's fun. And it's techy. And I would say you'd have to be about 50 to enjoy it. Apparently the manufacturers have been trialling them with traffic wardens and I for one would love to see traffic wardens tootling around in these just so you could laugh at them. I suppose one of the virtues of the Funtec 50 is that you're protected from the elements. Well as you can see, I'm not really. That's the elements just there and I'm not very well protected. This car or moped, I don't know what you'd call it, has a, a single cylinder 50cc two stroke engine and it's got loads of moped power and it can go from 0 to about 35 in a good 10 seconds. It's quite nippy. The steering actually is very precise. You want it to move it slightly and it will go where you want it to go. But I still don't trust it. And there is fun to be had because you can get one of the wheels up in the air really easily. Alright, I've been quite negative about the Funtec 50 and not had a lot of positive to say about it. And that's for one major reason. This little Wasp will set you back £5 short of three grand. 
And all right, you get scooter type handling with some weather protection, but surely that's a small car. And how many 16 year olds have got 3,000 pounds to spend anyway? I'm afraid it looks like a wasp and sounds like a wasp, only it's got no sting. I'll see you later on. If you want to do your bit to save the planet by driving an environmentally friendly small car, but you don't want to lose all of your driver enjoyment, I reckon you've got two choices. Number one, buy yourself a teeny tiny city car that'll do 800 miles and a teaspoonful of gas, and a games console with a copy of the latest Super Duper Racing Driver 72 game. Or you could buy yourself a hot hatch. Now, as I'm a little over 20 and wouldn't know how to switch a games console on, let alone use it, I'm going to go for the hot hatch. And so, gathered here today, we have two such cars. The, perhaps by comparison, a little more tepid Seat Arosa 16 valve and the positively sizzling and now near legendary Citroen Saxo VTS. The Seat Arosa is the Spanish company's version of the Volkswagen Lupo, and apart from a slightly tweaked front end, it is virtually identical. It's cheeky looking, but those alloys and slightly flared arches mean you don't feel a complete prat driving around town in it. Ah, the Citroen Saxo VTS. Nearly as common nowadays on our roads as those damn Gatsos, and almost as likely to get you into trouble with the law. Again, flared arches and nice alloys give it a purposeful stance, and it's certainly got more road presence than the smaller Arosa. But don't let that put you off. Because, as they say, all the best things come in small packages. So let's find out how the little Seat fares here beyond the city limits. Well, straight away, this thing may be small, but it's definitely not flimsy. You can really feel the VW influence in here, and that's in both the decidedly understated and discreet design and the build quality, it's solid. Interestingly and unusually, there's quite a lot of exposed body-coloured metal in here. And actually, I'm a real fan of that. Years ago, it was a sign of something horrible and cheap. Now, it's quite stylish. The more time I spend in here, the more I realise this interior may be that sort of VW-inspired, discreet, understated design. But look around, and there's actually quite a lot in here that lifts it just a little bit above the ordinary. I love the colour around the vents and around the clocks here. It's very nicely done. Small, delicate touches. Overall, there is a feeling of surprisingly high quality, again, for a small car. And this is where Seat are really improving their game. At slow speeds, in other words, city speeds, the controls are light and responsive, the gearbox is a little bit notchy if I'm going to be really fussy, but not too bad. Steering's nice, but you've got to remember, there's not a lot of car here, not a lot of weight or power, so you haven't got much inertia to overcome when you're moving off, nor a lot of momentum to stop or change direction when it gets a bit twiddly out there. Now. There are few things I enjoy more than a well and truly unfair fight. And I'm pleased to say that's what we've got here because from the Seat, 100 brake horsepower. From the Citroen, 120. That's a 20 brake horsepower advantage. In a big car, not a lot. In a small car, plenty. The Saxo, of course, is substantially larger than the Arosa, though you really wouldn't guess it from inside sitting in this seat. Mind you, it is a bit brighter. The lower waist height means the windows start earlier there's a bigger area of glass and more light let in, which is a plus. Where the Saxo really starts to lose out straight away is just in the general environment in here. It doesn't feel very special, not by a long way. Where the Arosa feels substantial, well put together, you can feel that VW influence coming through. The Saxo, ooh dear. Where the Saxo wins out over many cars is in performance in this, the VTS version. 1.6 litre 16 valve with, as we've said, 120 brake horsepower in a very light car means you know you're in for fun. And that's really why it's won people over over the years, because it goes like stink. Get towards the limit in the Saxo and it'll tell you exactly what's going on. It won't suddenly give up gripping and chuck you up a tree or in a ditch. 
to break away gently and slowly means you've got plenty of warning. You can make adjustments, feed in the power and haul it round a corner, maybe a dab on the brakes to straighten things out. You're very much in control driving this car, I hope. For about 11,800 quid then, the Saxo VTS brings you pin sharp handling and performance. It is a proper little hot hatch, along with, well, quite a lot of practicality really, albeit in a rather dated looking little package. By contrast, for nearly two grand left at about 9,900 pounds, the Dinky Seata Rosa, well, it brings you excellent, almost VW levels of build quality and discreetly good looks. It's got reasonable performance, certainly more of a warm rather than a hot hatch, but you do sacrifice a little bit of practicality. Either way, both add up to proof that you can, after all, have your environmentally friendly cake and drive it, if you see what I mean. That's it for this week's Motor Week. Next week, we're pulling out all the stops to bring you some super minis from around the globe. See you then. <laughs>